A moment of significant change or a turning point, altering your course, is known as an inflection point. In business, these moments have a significant impact in many ways. That's why we're speaking with leaders from across the asset management industry to hear the stories of their inflection points and the impact they've had on their journeys. Join me and my colleague Mark Spina as we explore the business of being in business with insights that can help you wherever you may find yourself. This is Inflection Points. Good afternoon, Mamadou. Thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. Fantastic. So um, for our listeners, I am so pleased to be joined on Inflection Points by Mamadou Abusar, who is the co-founder uh, and CEO of V-Square Quantitative Management. I'm so excited to have this conversation. Mamadou has just a, an incredibly interesting background um, professionally, personally, um, but brings an interesting lens for us to observe. And I think we will talk about this as we get towards the end of the discussion today, a landscape into the sustainable investing uh, world, right? And, and where we are in that journey. I think there's a lot of talk and there has been a lot of talk about sustainable investing. And so I want to get Mamadou as, as a, certainly a resident expert um, throughout so much of his career on this topic. Where are we in the journey of sustainable investing and getting those types of strategies into portfolios? Um, so Mamadou, I did a very brief overview of who you are, mm -hmm. but maybe just a couple minutes from you on you um, and what V-Square is. Sure. So, well, what a delight, first of all, to yeah. spend some time with you and talk about different inflation points in my journey. Yeah. And so the first part before having an inflation point is having roots. For me, this mm -hmm. is this is a starting point of everything. And for me, my roots are uh, being uh, French from Senegalese and Beninese descent. From immigrants' parents who left Senegal uh, for opportunities, uh, my dad being a scholar uh, who mm -hmm. left uh, with a scholarship to study science in, the, in France and became a professor of molecular genetics. And my mom, who uh, left early Benin to study in France and then work in a business uh, in the marketing and um, area for many, many years. So the roots gives you a sense of grounding. The roots give you a sense of purpose. And also the roots give you a sense of values. And the value uh, and the values that are actually plural that have my parents infused in us as, as a family was just to care about others, to uh, be cheerful for life, um, to be uh, fearful for also, you know, having strong faith. That was also part of my upbringing, but also always having a sense of purpose. And if I reflect back on my upbringing, I only have a smile on my face because it was an amazing, you know, lifestyle that we had. Uh, Grounding in also respect for academia and education. So with a dad being a professor of, at universities, uh, I had to be, you know, good at school. And it was not yeah. a pressure that was a, a negative <laughs> pressure. It was just a pressure that translated into reading the dictionary every night and then having a quiz in the morning. Did you say reading the dictionary every night? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And <laughs> quiz on definition in Latin and in French. And then it That's was also awesome. a, a soft pressure around um, getting a sense of where you would like to, to lead going forward. And so all that, you know, led to who I am as an individual, uh, what I tap into when I'm trying to recharge and what yeah. I'm excited about and what I'm passing to my children as well. Amazing. Well, you're one of the most motivated, passionate individuals I've ever met. And when you <laughs> learn more about your background, it, it comes as no shock. I was reading that um, for those of you who have an opportunity on uh, the V-Square website, um, Mamadou does an incredible job writing an article about uh, a couple of his uh, inflection points in his career and the parallels mm -hmm. they run. So I would highly recommend it to, to those who are interested in reading a little bit more about his background. Um, so you talked a little bit about some of those, your, your earlier days. Mm -hmm. um, are there particular inflection points that hit yeah. you as you think about those more formative years? Yeah. So there's one that kind of brings me back to my senior year uh, when I was uh, applying for a, a master program. So MSc in science in France mm -hmm. at ESCP Business School. And I had to write an essay at the time. And the essay I wrote was actually a bridge between what is today sustainability, but I was not called that as such at the time. <laughs> And uh, my view that the world needed to be more sustainable in the way we were allocating resources. Mm -hmm. uh, not knowing that, fast forward, my career will actually uh, let, lead me to that space as per se. But I recall writing that, um, that essay with actually passion and, mm -hmm. uh, and excitement about that particular topic. 
And if I think about uh, how your career evolved, I kind of call it the random walk versus the GPS approach. So <laughs> I wrote that with passion, but then my startup was a bit of a random walk. So I started away from a developing economy or, or working for a development bank, which was kind of my first goal, and I ended up becoming a currency trader. And I think wow. it's probably there's nothing more opposite than development that, banks exactly. and, then, and then being on the trading floor and yeah. arbitraging currencies. But nonetheless, even though that was my starting point, I never lost sight on the desire to find my holy grail. And for me, the holy grail is when your passion and expertise are intersecting. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's amazing when it happens, right? And for me, the, the way it happens is when people ask you, how is your job going? And you answer, I don't have a job, I have a life. And that's the way I answer to that particular question, right? Because I find my holy grail, I find my intersection where my passion meet my expertise, and then it's just a continuum uh, through that. So first inflection point, my entry point in the industry, with that essay I wrote with a view of being in the sustainable investing field or development banking field, and where I am today. That's so interesting because I think it was so, it was, how do I frame it? Like, forward thinking in that it, you knew where you were going mm -hmm. and even if the journey wasn't going to be a straight line to it yeah. right to to start off as a currency trader knowing you ultimately mm -hmm. wanted to 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 be thinking and, and and were so passionate about sustainable investing who knew yeah. what would eventually come yeah. in in your career it's just so interesting to think about i i think back to what if maybe we can take our listeners to the inflection point i think about as another inflection point mm -hmm. in your career where how many years ago you and Habib started yeah. to think about V-Square? Yeah. Um, it's like you know so long before what you want to do, yeah. and it just takes a while to get to it. So maybe talk a little bit about some of those yeah. early years and, and that particular inflection point. Sure. And, and the key point is goal settings. It's, mm -hmm. it's very important for uh, any individual, and it could be in your personal life or your professional life, to have a very rigorous process around goal settings. First yeah. of all, Think big. For me, it's always the thing that my dad and my mom infused to us. Think big. You can live in a small apartment, you can go through hardship in life, but your dreams has to be as big as the world. And so I grew up with that mindset of opening my eyes and, and my feelings to something bigger. And the goal setting led me to has a, have a very rigorous process. And I kept the same notebook, which I always smile about, because I actually wrote the playbook of where I will be at the age of 40, meaning running my own investment firm. And I kept wow. it. So next time I see you, I'll actually show I you. I want to see it. That's right? amazing. And, and, and when Abib and I met, it was in the mid-2000s, uh, so 2006, 2007, we worked together at HSBC Global Asset Management. Okay. And we had that immediate connection that was both personal from a heritage standpoint, him being French from Beninese descent and me being right. French from Senegalese and Beninese descent, but on a professional level, he's an actuary, he's a statistician, but also uh, just an amazing human being. And we were thinking, gosh, we have overlapping but also complementary skills. Mm -hmm. We are driven, we have a similar background, we have also a complementary uh, element that can help us build something unique at some point. So let's try to basically uh, be the best at what we do, first of all, right? Yep. And then when we feel ready, let's come together and do it. Mm -hmm. And so it's like you kind of uh, push a, uh, a piece on the, on the board and then think that it's going to play out at some point. That's what we did right. in 2007. And it played out 13 years later. Isn't that right? astonishing? <laughs> I want everybody to hear that. 2007, yeah. he and his business partner decided they wanted to open this firm. Yeah. I mean, what was the, what was the catalyst in 2020? Yeah. I mean, obviously I want to talk about 2007 today and what you did because you had various inflection points in there, but yeah. what was the catalyst in 20, or I guess it was prior to 2020, mm. obviously yeah. you have to do the setup, that you finally mm. said, now's the time. So we had a couple of markers that we've defined for our respecting path. One was to own our skill set. 
and okay. I will not discount skill set. We are in a field that requires expertise. So yeah. we've all agreed that let's be the best at what we do to the best of our abilities, right? You have mm -hmm. to put a qualifier, but let's do our every best to hone and hammer something that becomes a skill set. On my side, I'm a innovator, a disruptor, a product guy. Uh, Abe is a portfolio manager, a research guy. And mm -hmm. so he kind of grew in the factor base and active quant and ETF world and, and build that expertise. And he's known mm -hmm. for that. And on my side, I build that product innovation, market disruption for leadership background. And that was the first part. The second part mm -hmm. was make sure that we also good at managing people. Let's be in senior leadership role where we manage not only people, but also P&Ls and kind of have that under our own rim. And the last one was also let's make sure that our expertise is recognized by the market because the error that a lot of people are doing, they are internal, they are internal leaders. It's about yeah. me becoming an MD or a partner in my firm, but not being recognized in the marketplace for my expertise. So we needed to be outside in the world and make sure that right. our expertise was known for, respected for, and we can keep on learning. And then it's a matter of um, of being bold, right? It's just uh, <laughs> the day you act, it's like being, it's like, an, I'll describe it as an option. You know, when you buy an option, you have your entry point and you have your ex exercise price that you're ready and you have your floor. And then at some point, it, it is a diminish, diminishing value to stay in the same position. Right. We reached a point where it was becoming a diminishing value for us to remain in these positions. Mm. And so we felt it was time to exercise the option. We built enough value in the optionality of our own career by making bets on ourselves. Right. And then once we reached that pivotal point of exercising at the right price, we did it. You know, and then we decided to jump and build V Square. I um I have I have so many great little nuggets that you have just shared. I think that's just an incredible story. I think that idea of owning your expertise. I always tell people, be an expert in something, mm -hmm. right? Own it, be passionate about it. And I, I, what you say about, I think we can so quickly get caught up in our own corporate culture, yeah. whether you work at a big firm or a small firm, but I got promoted, I got this, I got that, mm -hmm. but are you recognized? Are you a brand, yeah. right? I think about you and Abib and, mm -hmm. and sustainable investing, you are brands mm -hmm. in that, in that mm -hmm. space, right? Recognized, respected. And I think that's, it's just an incredible story to be that thoughtful, 13 years ago or mm -hmm. 15 years ago mm -hmm. now yeah. to know the exact markers to set in place to uh, mm -hmm. to, to actually take that and, and make the bet on yourself. Yeah. Um, that's advice I like to give people as well. Just take the bet on yourself. Yeah. Um, so between 2007 and 2020, you yeah. were doing a lot of things building that brand, building yeah. that expertise. Um, were there particular inflection points in those 13 or even let's call it 10 years that mm -hmm. really stick out to you professionally that helped yeah. you continue to build that expertise. Yeah, and it's something that I like to share. I was doing ESG A before ESG became cool, but also without <laughs> having a title to, 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 to do it. Okay. And because we tend to be caught up into titles and what it means. Mm -hmm. So I volunteered to do ESG at Nozen. It was never part of you know what I was asked to be doing. I was right. hired as an equity strategist. That was my job description. Yeah. But I saw a not only a market opportunity, but also a uh, an opportunity to lead the market in a different way. And so I was part of a working group that was called a working group. It was not a title. It was not a job. And I was doing that off hours to basically oh, wow. kind of uh, keep up with, with the pace and make sure that my expertise was up up, up to the market. And so my, my key takeaway from that is that don't wait to have the title to do what you're passionate about, what's right for your company, what's right for your communities. Do it. That's what yeah. true leadership is all about. Uh, often people are mistaken the what I call the corporate leadership structure. Mm -hmm. to the true leadership where you have a followership based on your expertise. And the best yeah. leaders often are also outside of the corporate realm. They are civic leaders, right? They are artists, they are musicians that actually use their platform by inspiring others. And for me, this is the key point of leadership. It has to be outside of a hierarchy of pyramids mm -hmm. of roles and titles. It has to be coming from within. Yeah. And also it has to be linked to a passion that you have. Mm -hmm. I think somebody said recently, like a, a manager is not necessarily a leader and mm -hmm. a leader is not necessarily a manager. I agree. I agree. Right. I mean, I just think it, it's so true. And um, you, maybe we can take a little bit of a sidebar and talk yeah. about the work that you do yeah. for the French businesses. Yeah. 
Um, cause I think that illustrates for me personally, um, your leadership in a different way, right? Mm-hmm. Your leadership for it, for an associated passion, yeah. um, that I think probably helps you in your business life as well. Yeah. So sure. I'm a, what is called a French friend advisor, which is an appointment by the French prime minister. And we are in full of advisors around the world and we volunteer our time to, uh, support French businesses, uh, getting in business in certain markets. So on my mm-hmm. side, US as a territory, Chicago as a place where I'm located. And so we are helping businesses coming to the US, plugging them with the ecosystem, lawyers and bankers and so on, but also bringing along new talents um, that could come and work in the US through an, in- it's called an internship program that this part is called a VIE, which is very specific. It's a okay. up to 24 month, it's an apprenticeship program. And so the reason why I wanted to be involved is A, I'm French and proud. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. Always wanted to help friends, that, right? That's totally fair. <laughs> yeah. And but B, it's also the passion of giving back. Uh, whatever gift you have has no value if it's not shared with the world. Right. And and gift is, is people always think that gift is oh he's gifted though. Not gift in the sense of being gifted, gift in the right. sense of being passionate about what you do and having the ability to live your life with a certain set of standards. That's what kind of that kind of gift. And we all have gifts. They will all have these gifts that have been, you know, passed on through us that we live and breathe every single day. But for me, the main point was always trying to find a way to give back. You know, whatever you have, if it's time, if it's resources, if it's a network, if it's any Anything that you can give back to others, you have to do it. Incredible. Um, I guess to that end, as we as we look forward, the last question I'll have before we jump into the yeah. where we are in this journey of sustainable investing, um, which you've been on for for some time. What are some ongoing sources of of motivate? You're obviously incredibly self motivated, and I think quite inspirational. What are sources of motivation and inspiration for you today? as one who did the dream, right? You did start the asset management firm. It's focused on sustainable investing. You're living your passion. What are your ongoing sources of motivation? So what I love the most about the position where I'm at today is the freedom of thoughts, Hmm. which is a different mindset than, you know, being doing well in a corporate setting. Yeah. Because every day we leave, we wake up in the morning with a whiteboard and that ability to shape the future in a certain way. Mm-hmm. And that's so exciting. So for me, if I think about the legacy that I would like to leave going forward, it's just to be that new vector of change in the way we allocate capital. Mm-hmm. Inspire a younger generation to become entrepreneurs. We need more entrepreneurs, mm-hmm. even yeah. more so in time of crisis, even more so in time of uncertainty. And by the way, most of the greatest brands in the world were built in time of crisis. We've launched mm-hmm. V-Square in April 2020. I think you can all recall what happened in in April Mm -hmm. 2020. It would have been easier to say, oh, gosh, you know what? Let's probably pause. Let's revisit. Or, hey, let's me call back, you know, my former boss and say, if I can still have a hot hot seat somewhere. Get that job back. But no, we were so determined to actually carry on but with a different sense of purpose. We felt Mm -hmm. that it was our calling. We felt it was the right time to do it. And so for me, um, I hope that I could inspire others, you know, in my my own capacity. I hope also that uh, we could shape an industry that we, you know, should look and reflect the society we live in. And and, and I'm passionate about that particular topic of diversity uh, because being who I am as someone who lived around the world, I've seen the value of diversified human capital. I've seen it living in the Middle East. I've seen it living in Africa, living in France, living in the US. The world is such an amazing place of resources and talents and abilities that we have to tap into. Mm -hmm. And so us kind of being brave enough to do that and building our own investment firm, we hope we could inspire others to do so and also show to the world that it is is doable in, in various capacity. Absolutely. It's the right thing to be doing. I love the way you all frame it as diversified human capital. Um, And I think we all need to get used to thinking that way, just the way that you frame it. Um, I think that's one of the challenges with sustainable investing or ESG or SRI or name your, uh, you know, your acronym here. Um, So if we can pivot, because you have been passionate Mm. about slash involved in sustainable Mm -hmm. investing for so long, Mm -hmm. you know, 
I think you you probably would think as as I do, there have been various inflection points through yeah. the journey of sustainable investing, and probably find ourselves at one right now. I was saying before we started recording, you know, we've had recent talk in the last I don't know six to twelve months a lot more about greenwashing. Yeah. Uh, Morningstar very publicly removed hundreds of of ESG products from their ca- mm-hmm. that category within their database, and so. Mm-hmm. Where do you think we are now in, in terms of the journey of sustainable yeah. investing? And yeah. are there particular inflection points that you've observed yeah. uh, over the course of time? I think we are a pivotal point from a credibility standpoint. Mm-hmm. The industry grew in popularity. And as you become more popular, there is more scrutiny. It happens yeah. in, you know, you know, for in personal lives, it happens in any type of setting. It's it's part of human nature. You are more visible, therefore people ask more or demand more from yeah. you. But in the the field grew from the old SRI era that dated back to gosh, gosh the early 1900s. You mm-hmm. could think about how religious entities were avoiding being involved in certain set of businesses based oh, on their own beliefs. Point. You know, it brings you back to that time. Fast forward to um, the early 90s with some of the first kind of indexes developed with KLD, the likes of MSCIs and all that. Mm-hmm. That was one point, the ability to reflect your values through an index. And for me, the launch of the first Dow Jones Sustainability Index was a key marker of the industry. Okay. Yeah. Then fast forward, it was a very slow start. Only a few indexes could be uh, mm-hmm. tracked. The performance was, you know, up for debate in a certain extent. And all of a sudden, we move from that negative screening approach of su- socially responsible investing yeah. to that acronym that is a meta acronym, by the way. <laughs> and it was a paper <laughs> uh, by the World Bank that say that you could look into environmental, social, and governance. Now, mm-hmm. as practitioners, we always do a bad job of um, making the distinction. We just we love acronyms. Lump it all together. Like like brick somehow summarizes emerging market exposure, where Brazil, yeah. Russia, India, and China had nothing to do with one another. Mm-hmm. I would argue that arguably the common denominator between ES and G is the impact on society, society and communities. And so we should not lose sight on why that industry started at the first place. And I think the pivotal point that I'm referring to is that we tend to lose sight about that. Right, we decided to put these tools as a new range of tools to make better investment decision, but also have better societal impact for companies. Mm-hmm. And so the pivotal point is when you move from uh, shareholder privacy to stakeholder capitalism, where companies serve a bigger purpose. Of course, they have to return value to shareholder, but also they need to like look after the employees, the su- the suppliers, the communities, and the environments. So that pivotal point explain why now there is more scrutiny and interest for the field. Mm-hmm. I call now the era where we are, I call it the 3.0 era for sustainable investing, where we did SRI, then we did best in class ESG, and now yep. we are about impact and materiality. Yes. And now investors are demanding, is my dollar investing in this way having a true impact? Mm-hmm. Right? And it's a fair question to ask. If that's your goal, are we serving the purpose of you know, allowing you to have a higher level of impact as an investor. And so now it's about metrics, it's about SDGs, so sustainable development goals, it's about societal impact. So that's how we'll describe the field, SRI, then the best in class era integration, and now the impact era where it's about meaningful impact on the society as well. I love the way that you just framed that, especially this most recent one with with impact. I feel like that's the direction people are going. Yeah. It's not just putting your money into a green ETF Mm -hmm. or green Mm -hmm. price is my dollar having the impact that I want it to have. Um, Do you see, or would you propose to, to project what would come next? So I will say that uh, innovation will be a key leader in that space because now you have regulatory framework that are asking investors and, and companies to do more. Think mm-hmm. about the new proposal by the SEC on climate disclosure, right? 
think about the EU green taxonomy and the Article 8 and 9 that requires a classification of products in mm -hmm. the industry based on a set of metrics. So if I were to have a crystal ball, which I do not have, right, I'm often <laughs> more wrong than right. But mm -hmm. as far as what I'm expecting is that uh, we will see a l more focus on climate risk as a macro risk, but also what has to be addressed at a portfolio level. So I'll put climate on top of my agenda going forward. And I think mm -hmm. every year we can have a different talk and conversation about the inflection point of climate policies. Mm -hmm. That'll be number one. The number two for me will be around that true sense of uh, purpose that uh, is required in our field to address societal issues. Mm -hmm. uh, you cannot operate in vacuum as companies. You, what you are doing in the world is impacting, you know, it has negative externalities, but that you could, if you're mindful of them, you can address them. So for me, that's going to be the role and purpose of companies and the value of companies. Think about how companies evolve from being valued on what they had in the balance sheet, the manufacturers and the machineries, to now being all about their digital value, all about mm -hmm. their, you know, well, digital footprint. And now we move in a place where people will care about their, uh, societal footprint as well, equally to the digital footprint. So for me, this is the evolution that I'm expecting in the field and with more expertise at the table as well. And that's such an interesting point. I've seen more and more organizations at, at, at well, of all sizes that are implementing roles like the chief sustainability officer yeah. or the chief yeah. diversity officer. You know, I think yeah. you're starting to see this really take hold and, and make change. And you've seen large organizations, um, uh, you know, make, put it a, 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 a stake in the ground like NASDAQ, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Even organizations saying, I'm not going to go to your conference if you don't have diverse slate of speakers. So I think you're mm -hmm. starting to see finally, yeah. finally, some mm. action taken versus just, just words, which I feel yeah. like it had been for so long. Agree. Um, so I, 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 I have just a couple of things I wanted to play back just sure. for those listening. I think some of the things that mom and you just talked about, I have one parting question for you, a little bit more fun, but um, not that this has not been fun. I shouldn't have said more fun, just more <laughs> lighthearted. Um, you don't have a job, you have a life. I think that is the goal we all should strive for, right? Is that mm -hmm. you have let your passion intersect with your expertise and therefore you don't have a job, you have a passion. Mm -hmm. Be bold, right? Mm -hmm. I always say, take the risk. Be bold. What I tell my younger self, take the risk, yeah. right? Be be bold. Um, be recognized as the expert outside mm -hmm. of your own organization. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that those were were really just incredible sort of takeaways. Mm -hmm. um, bet on yourself was another one that I'd written down. Mm -hmm. I think for all of us as we listen and think about, you know, our own inflection points and maybe we sit at one right now. Mm -hmm. and need that little push to be bold or take the bet on yourself. And I hope that, that people continue to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do want to encourage everyone, and we're really lucky to have V-Square as one of our members, one of our asset manager members here at Flex. And for those of you listening that do want to have their dollars making an impact, I would really suggest taking a look at, at the products that they have in market and will be having in market in short order. Um, it is a way for your your dollars to have an impact on uh, your values. So um, before we wrap up, I would love to get your thoughts on what are you reading currently um, or listening to that music or podcast? I always like to leave our listeners with some mm -hmm. a nugget to take away that they may learn from. So, Actually, I will not share a book or a podcast. I'll tell you the way I disconnect and reconnect with okay. what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. My yeah. passion is outside of work is art. Ah. And what I did last weekend, I went to visit two artist galleries in Chicago and spent an hour of my time listening to the artists, their feelings, their emotions, the way they were you know, displaying that in a painting. And I came home on Sunday at five and at seven took a notebook and build a new product that mm -hmm. will come and that has nothing to do with art. But my really? inspiration, the way I reboot is often by looking at sources of inspiration outside of my own area. It's not in spreadsheet. I don't see any light in spreadsheet as per se. I find formulas and answers, yeah. but my ideation process is an iterative process like artists have. You start with a drawing, you sketch things around, and then you get infuse uh, and inputs from other sources. And I love doing that. I'd love to go to museums and art galleries. Mm -hmm. And often the best ideas I had were coming from walking out of a studio or out of an exhibition and thinking about a new product ID that was lingering somewhere in my mind, but it was locked and I needed to lock 
uh, to do that. So that's what I did last weekend. And there's a new product that will come along in a few weeks that has nothing to do with painting, <laughs> but that uh, should be a disruptive product in the marketplace. And, and I call Abby on Sunday night at eight and say, gosh, I have no idea. I got to talk to you. Oh my gosh. Well, <laughs> so, I'm, I'm excited to know what that product is considering what I know you have coming. Um, and, and we couldn't live in a better city for those that want to unlock if you're like Habib and, or like Habib, yeah. like Mama too, <laughs> yeah. um, with the Art Institute and all the different yeah. museums here uh, in our in the city. So, well, Mamadou, thank you so much for joining. This has just been an incredible conversation. Um, I really uh, am so pleased to get the opportunity to know you and work with you and get to be a part of you and be living out you know, no, your dream. Pleasure to share. Thank you so much for your time today. Awesome. You bet, Mamadou. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The information contained in this recording is provided as is for educational and informational purposes only and should not serve as the basis for any trading or investing decisions. Flex Networks makes no representations and disclaims all express, implied, and statutory warranties of any kind to any viewer, listener, or other third party. Neither Flex Networks nor any of its affiliates make any endorsement of any particular company, security, product, or financial strategy, and nothing contained in this recording should be construed as investment advice. Investors should undertake their own due diligence and carefully evaluate companies before investing.